Sarah, are you okay? You still contemplating that question? Something to think about. All right. So today and really the next couple days, th these are all sensitive topics, Walker. So I expect you to be just super mature about these conversations. And hopefully you'll learn a lot about males and females and how we function and get to where we are. So, interesting stuff going on. 10, 16, we'll kind of move around as we go through this. Important concepts from previous units. Actually, you know what? Let me look at sperm. Um, turn to 10, 22. So, the sperm is a lot like a space shuttle in that... You know, you watched the video the other day, the sperm, once it entered the egg, all the, the tail and parts started breaking off, and then you had the main, like, payload that, that entered and was doing something or offering its DNA inside the egg. So sperm kind of works in a similar way. Um, if you think about sperm and egg, egg's, like, ginormous, and then a sperm is, like, that big. So it's, like, really, really small in comparison to the egg. There's not a lot going on with the sperm. The egg contains almost all of the, uh, well, really all the material, everything except the DNA um, that's needed for cells to start dividing. My hair's sticking up. Okay. Number one, Walker. Uh, the mitochondria provide chemical energy, ATP, for cells by performing cellular respiration using certain triggers. Good. Where in the sperm do we find the mitochondria? The mid piece. So if you look at the bottom of the page here, you see these little uh, packets or uh, different sections of mitochondria that are in there, and they are there for the purpose of? Providing energy. Energy. Remember those sperm, they had a long way to go. If you just think about the size of a sperm and where it has to travel to. Um, and so it needed lots of energy to travel to get to where it's going. Number two, uh, Matthew. Matthew. Pheromones are a form of long-distance communication between an organism using chemical attractions. Yeah, if you skip down in the notes there, it talks about pheromones, but it's basically the same thing. Chemical attraction attractants released in the outside environment many times involved to attract a mate or to mark a territory. Um, you could also think of like ants that lay down little chemical trails when they're going when they find food, you ever wonder how like ants, like you see one and then there's like 4,000 other ones just following in a straight line. So they're laying chemicals down on the ground there um, for their little buddies to smell and follow along so that they know where to go to get, get whatever they're getting. It's good to know. All right, um, and in many times pheromones are used as attractants for a mate. We see this a lot in nature, a lot of deer, like I'd like to deer hunt. so. A lot of female deer, or there's, or you think of dogs. There's scent, scent that is released when it's mating time, and then the males are able to pick up on that. Um, what's the? Uh, a lot of animals do it. Lions. I've seen cows do it. Um, the thing where the male like turns up his nose all funny. You can tell he's sniffing for a female. I think the expression is called flaming, um, where he's smelling her out. Anyway. All right, and then number three, Katie. Matter and energy for growth and development comes from the environment. All right, so in order for all these things to happen, you have to have energy. Um, we will, the discussion on evolution, which will happen at the end of the year, really evolution is all about not dying and having sex. And so we're kind of talking about the sex part right now, but essentially that's what's going on is how well can you survive and then pass on traits to your offspring, okay? So all this is gonna tie back in. Hermaphrodites, that is quite the interesting subject. Prefer I wasn't videoing this, but for all you people at home, I guess it's a worthy discussion. Um, See, I don't know that your book addresses this a lot here, but I am going to talk about it just a little bit to make sure um, everybody knows what's going on. What is the benefit? Now, 
humans, you've probably heard of people that are hermaphrodites. Typically what that is, is where sex organs don't develop properly and you wind up with both of them. Um, when do you think a human would be a hermaphrodite? Like what, what would happen to cause that? We, we watched development take place, you know, in the video the other day. Typically, you can determine the sex of a child by about 15 or 16 weeks. We just said, you know, every man and female all start out as female, as kind of that blank slate um, individual that starts growing. So what do you think would have to happen to cause someone to be a her hermaphrodite? You may have heard the term, I think they uh, may re refer to it more this way nowadays where um, someone's not completely one sex or another, or maybe they have anatomical parts, both parts, or m a lot of times they're undeveloped, both of them, but um, what, do, what do they call that? It's a very small percentage of the population. Usually it's referred to as intersex. I don't know if you've heard that term. Usually that's kind of like w what most people would have called hermaphrodite back in the day. Um, but what do you think would cause a person to result in having um, different anatomical parts of both male and female? So like two X's and one Y? No, two X and Y, that's uh, Klinefelter's. And usually that results in sterility, but not in uh, extra sex organs. Mm, no. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Any other guesses while the roosters crow? So we all start out as female, and then how do you become a male? I mean, I just said you're going to have your sex organs that should be developed by about 15 or 16 weeks. You can tell that on the ultrasound when you go get one. Um, what has to happen in order for you to develop male sex organs if you're developing as a female early on? I can tell you haven't considered these things. The rooster was doing that during uh, the test today during the second period. <laughs> I mean, like, he was going off like 15 times. Anyone? Typically what would happen is, let's say you're developing as this kind of blank slate female and then you're going to have males with the y chromosome they're going to have uh testosterone um androgens switch on they're going to have the male sex hormone switch on which is going to start the production of male sex organs and then they'll develop from there so and then that's normal development and then usually most of that's shut off until puberty again um, so what do you think would lead to having both sex organs develop? Tay? Maybe not developing enough, like, testosterone. Or maybe starting to develop... Both. Both. I would say probably too late. Like, maybe that's released a little bit later and you've already started to develop female, um, sex organs. And then, so, and then maybe that switch gets kicked on and hormones start getting released and you start developing male sex organs and um, a little bit later. There's some kind of genetic thing. Um, a lot of people in, I want to say it's the Dominican Republic, uh, and there's a name for it where these boys are born with, gosh, what is the name of that? They're born and they look physically from the outside pretty much like a female. And then they're reproductives grow and fill in by usually the time puberty takes place. And so there's a lot of confusion that goes on there. I'll have to look that up, but it's some type of genetic disorder that's really prominent in that kind of small, isolated population. Um, and so, yeah, sometimes that happens in different places. A lot of times if you're born with both sex organs, what happens? Let's say you had a kid and they were born with both. What do, what do a lot of parents do? get rid of one of them, yeah. Usually they decide one or the other, um, and then they go with that. Typically, what would you think a human hermaphrodite, their chromosome chromosomes would look like? 
It's going to be XX or XY. Okay. Probably XY because you're producing male hormones for male structures, but maybe um, it just for some reason didn't turn on or there was a mutation or something. Didn't produce enough and um, you wound up producing both sex organs. It's super duper rare to produce like both function, functional organs. Most of the time when that happens, usually pe people are sterile and neither one works or um, they might have kind of a an undeveloped ovary or testes or something like that. But anyway, so there's some issues that can arise in development. I'm gonna have y'all do a little project next week for easy grade on um, developmental disorders. And so now, all that being said, there are some organisms that are meant to be hermaphrodites. Um, what is the benefit of being a hermaphrodite, Miranda? Um, it's easier to reproduce. Maybe. Why? Um, because you wouldn't have to look for that. You wouldn't have to look for the opposite sex to sexually reproduce. You could just. Yeah. So if you're a hermaphrodite, you don't have to find someone of the opposite sex to reproduce with. You can just find anyone and reproduce um if you and the other benefit there is who gets to reproduce everyone right so it's not just half the population which normally reproduces everyone's reproducing so not only is it easier to find a mate you also got everyone that's reproducing so there are benefits typically um as your note says that most hermaphrodites are not cannot self-fertilize um, sometimes plants you'll see like self-pollination, which would essentially kind of be like this, but most of this we're referencing animals here. Um, because really what you wind up with then is you wind up with inbreeding if you're self-fertilizing. So what more classic inbreeding could take place than someone breeding with themselves? Um, sequential hermaphrodites. These are organisms that can change sex based on environmental pressures. I was looking up and trying to find some good examples for, um, the second one, and I really couldn't, I don't know, maybe y'all can look it up for extra credit if you want to share some, um, because the ones they gave me sounded more like the first one. The proto uh, gynus or gynus, um, these are ones where the alpha female becomes the male. So, like in the case of the wrasse fish, there's this fish down in the Keys, and it's uh, the male is usually like blue and bigger, and I think it's W R A S S E. I think is how you spell it, something like that. Um, and then the females, I think, are like smaller and yellow. If I'm not mistaken. Um, and what happens is when so there's one male with a harem of females, and when the male dies, some you gotta have a male, you gotta have a female step up and become the male. And so there's a hormonal change that takes place. I want to say it takes about 20 days, maybe a month, something like that. And the largest female in the in the harem there develops into the male. And so her body, instead of producing estrogen, starts producing testosterone, which changes the production of eggs to sperm. And then she is able to fertilize the eggs from the females in the group. So it's a way of make sure making sure you're maintaining males and females in a group. Um, y'all are probably familiar with clownfish are, can do this where they can change sex. I was a little bit confused on my reading. I'll have to go back and look further into which one they actually are. Um, the proto andrus would be where the male becomes the female. I guess if you have too many males that one of them can become the female and, um, so you can have more reproduction take place. But I had trouble finding an example on that one. So I had to look that up. But anyway, um... Guarantees the most fit genes are passed on and also guarantees that you have an individual who is able to reproduce. And if, if y'all remember anything from our steroid talk um, early in the year, well, I don't know if we looked at it, but if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the hormone testosterone and estrogen, I don't know if there's a picture in your book here of it. It's not, it was earlier in the year, I think. Yeah, it's not in this section. But if you, if you look at a picture of estrogen and testosterone, they're almost the same. There's a couple of small variations um, in the molecule, but it's very slight. 
And so it's not a stretch, a big stretch to go from producing eggs to producing sperm. Um, most animals besides like mammals and um, birds, I wanna say most other animals are not chromosomal, like sex dependent. Um, a lot of them, like for instance, uh, sea turtles. One I'll talk about one I know about for sure. Sea turtles, their babies develop into male and female from what? What, what determines the sex? They are temperature dependent. So depending on the temperature, it will determine whether they become male or female. And gosh, I can't even remember, but like, so a sea turtle digs out a hole in the sand and it lays its eggs down in there. Um, when we were in Costa Rica, we'd see them lay and they'd be like 100, 120 eggs in, the, in one little uh, pit where they'd dig. Usually we were collecting, we'd get up behind these turtles as they were laying eggs and we'd collect the eggs in like a plastic like Walmart bag and then carry them with us. And then we'd, we'd re-dig a hole in the ground and put them in the ground closer to um, the place we were staying because poachers would come along like each night and they would dig up the eggs and then go sell them. And so um, most of the sea turtles are in danger because of that. But anyway, um, the, the eggs down in the hole, depending on the depth, like you've got one sex on bottom and one sex on top because the closer to the top, the closer you are to like the sun hitting the sand, so it's a little bit warmer, and the ones on the bottom are a little bit cooler, so it determines what sex uh, the individuals are gonna be. So it's not like an X and Y chromosome thing like we have. Um, anyway, so any questions on the hermaphrodites? Oh, let's do an example of this. So how does hermaphroditic sex work, you may ask? Good question, Matthew. So take your fingers and make little trigger fingers out of them. These are not shooting fingers, so I can't get in trouble. These are actually earthworms. Everybody ready? So take them and make a little picture, except kind of overlap it. Okay, so your index finger in this scenario is the earthworm, like the main body of the earthworm. Your thumbs in this scenario are the male reproductive organs of the earthworm. So essentially you get the earthworms, they line up next to each other. Obviously they'd be closer to one another, but they line up next to each other. They insert their male reproductive organs and they exchange sperm with one another. And in doing so, you get DNA from a different earthworm. Everybody gets to have babies and that's how earthworms come to be. Okay, do you got questions? You're learning a lot, I can tell. All right. Mechanisms for sexual reproduction. So how do organisms reproduce? Fertilization involves the, the um, fusion of a sperm and egg to form a diploid zygote. So in humans, sperm and egg, how many chromosomes? How many? 23. A zygote has 46. And then that zygote then develops into who we are. And so all the cells that you see in your body or anyone else should be have 46 chromosomes. Now there are some chromosomal abnormalities y'all are probably familiar with like Down syndrome or one of y'all mentioned XXY, which is Klinefelter's where you'd have an extra one. Um, Down syndrome, you would have an extra one. You can have just one X, which is Turner's. So you'd only have 45. So there are a number of different chromosomal abnormalities, um, but m for the most part of the population, um, 46 is the norm, okay? Now, mechanisms of reproduction. External fertilization. Mariah, tell us about that. Fertilization occurs outside the body. This occurs in three stages. Uh, the okay, so a lot of fish and amphibians, now, not all, mm, not all of them, but a lot of fish and amphibians use external fertilization. And there's a good picture of this on page 1016. Yes, these <clears throat> frogs on 1016 are in the dance of love, so to speak. Um, and you have the male on top, looks like he's got that female frog in a headlock and he's holding on for dear life. What is she doing? What are those little black dots on the page? Eggs. eggs, good. She's throwing out eggs every which way but loose. 
I don't know if y'all remember Miranda and um, Katie. Um, last year we talked about cane toads. Cane toads are frogs that can release about 20 eggs at a whack. And what is, so that, excuse me, 20 eggs, 20,000 eggs at a time. Um, that's a lot of eggs to throw out. What is his purpose there on rotting her like that? Why's he got a hold of her, not letting go? He's what? He's squeezing them out. I don't know if he's actually mechanically squeezing eggs or not. No, I, I don't know about that. What What is he squeezing out, so to speak? He wants to be right next to her in those eggs so he can what? Fertilize the, Fertilize the egg. So what's he releasing? Sperm. sperm. Okay. So when she's squeezing out the eggs, he's squeezing out sperm. And so hopefully what his agenda is, is the sperm will then... Um, I don't know how many he releases, but I'm sure it's a, a, a large volume. It hopes that these sperm all find their way to one of those eggs, that they get fertilized, and that they develop into a new frog, okay? Frogs are really cool in terms of, like, their modes of sexual reproduction. You've got frogs who will take, and they'll go up to, like, little um, bromeliads or, like, flowers in the rainforest that, that have, like, fill up with water when it rains, and they'll go lay their egg in there, and they'll go around to different spots and lay different eggs in different ones so they can develop. There's this male frog um, who will swallow the eggs in his little pouch where he, like, ribbits and stuff, and the frogs will develop in there until they're big enough to actually, like, jump out and, and crawl away. Um, there's a female frog who will lay her eggs, and she, like, pushes them up on her back. So she doesn't have too many of them. She pushes them up on her back. And so the fertilized eggs, like her skin grows around them on her back. And then when they get big enough, like the tadpoles get big enough, they'll break through the skin and swim out. Yeah. Okay, this is kind of an like egg question. A who? Like egg question. Okay. Somebody brought this up, R and K selective species, this morning. We talk about ecology. We haven't got there in this class, but we will. Um, R are the rapid reproducers, and K are the usually the slower reproducers. Most frogs are still, even if they just have a few, are st still probably R species. Um, I would say, you know, it's a continuum, though. They're probably more toward the middle. When you've only got, like, the ones that they come out of their mouth, they're already developed into, like, frogs with legs so they have had a lot of parental investment and they've been taken care of more so than a frog that you see with thousands of eggs that are released so they're probably more toward the center you're still going to have some predation and stuff but it's going to be much less than than the ones where they have a bunch of tadpoles that's a good point all right that's external fertilization and you see this a lot in organisms that live like in the ocean like uh like things that live on the reef. They're gonna, uh, sponges and anemones and stuff like that. A lot of these things, they release thousands of eggs or thousands of sperm, and then they're hoping that they come together and, and attach somewhere and grow into a new organism. So it's just a method of where if you put out enough individuals, hopefully some will survive. Internal fertilization. Walker, tell us about that one. Fertilization occurs internally. This occurs in most animals, including reptiles, birds, and mammals. The presence of water is key to following the evolution of animals from fish to reptiles to mammals. All right. In order for internal fertilization, well, you can't do external fertilization where? What? Where it's dry. That's right. So in order to have external fertilization, you have to do that in the water. Um, and so you see this kind of evolution or movement away from the water and you're able to do internal fertilization, which also means those individuals are able to get bigger and stronger. You don't usually have as many. This goes kind of toward what um, Tay was saying about case-selected case species where you have less individuals, but they're much more developed. Um, and so now I will say there are some fish that internally fertilize. Um, there's some sharks that I know of. Y'all may have seen some of these sharks that have live birth. There's one that I know has a bunch of babies and like 
the bigger ones eat the little smaller ones until there's usually only one or two left um, and then she'll have those but most of this is referring to reptiles birds and mammals um, a lot of reptile I'll say this for like snakes I can't remember the percentage but there's a pretty good bit of snakes that have you know they do internal fertilization and then they also have live birth so some snakes, most turtles and other reptiles, they have egg, well, lizards and stuff, they have eggs that hatch out. But having eggs is much more vulnerable than if you're you know, a copperhead and you've got a bunch of babies that are already developed and when you squirt them out, they're already going off which way and they can bite something and kill it. You know, it's a lot easier to eat an egg than it is to eat a live copperhead that's trying to bite you, Katie. Now, couple years ago me and my buddy were at, well probably like 10 years ago my buddy and I were at hiking in the wilderness area and we saw a copperhead this is in probably mid-october um going through live birth and you could see the babies coming out I videoed it I don't know videos on the Facebook somewhere but um you could see the babies coming out like one after another and so it's a much more helps you out in terms of survival doing that let's see Internal fertilization. So you've got sperm in there, finds the egg, makes the babies. Um, any questions on that one? All right, so mechanisms for pheromones we talked about, spermatogenesis. How do the sperm form? All right, so the male reproductive system is on page 1019, and I'm gonna skip that. Um, let's skip over to 1022. Spermatogenesis, genesis means? The beginning, good. Creation, the beginning. Um, where does sperm come? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this was discussed in detail in the video. I think y'all talked about like they will y'all watch the thing on like nurse cells and all the stuff that's required. You've got to undergo this division where you reduce the chromosomal number, like you see here on the right side, and then you've got to have these nurse cells that add all the parts to it. Um, let's go through the parts real quick here. So the head contains this acrosome, which has all these digestive enzymes. So when we watched the video yesterday, remember all those, or the day before, remember all those sperm trying to get in there? On, around the egg, there's this like protective jelly or protective coating, kind of like a force field almost. And so the sperm have these digestive enzymes that they use to kind of make their way through that. Um, and that's on that acrosome. Um, the nucleus contains the sperm's DNA, the 23 chromosomes. That's the main part, part of that. The midpiece contains the mitochondria that we talked about, which is used for movement. And then um, the tail is basically just a flagella, like you see in a lot of other, other organisms, composed of microtubules from the skeleton that helps it to move and swim. Um, and so those are the pretty basic. Um, you've got a protective cap, and you've got some DNA and you've got a mechanism to move. Um, so it's pretty simple, the structure of most, you know, most any sperm. Um, and usually you wind up with four of them, or you should wind up with four of them. You wind, you have a diploid cell, it divides twice. <clears throat> we'll talk about meiosis a little bit more in the spring, but basically what you have is a reducing of the chromosomal number and then sister chromatids separate. Um, Eggs is not the same. So this is gonna be a contrast mason when we get to eggs tomorrow. You don't wind up with four eggs when you start out with one cell. So it's a little bit different for the ladies, okay? Male hormonal pattern. Now, I said this this morning and I think everybody got a little nervous and nobody wanted to answer. So maybe y'all be more forthcoming. When we talk about people being hormonal, who do we usually reference? Now keep in mind, everyone's hormonal because we talked about a lot of hormones that people use. But when we, when we see that kind of like cultural reference about someone's hormones or acting hormonal, who are we talking about? Teens. Hmm? Like teens and adolescents. Teens and adolescents? Well, I didn't think about that. But yeah, I was going more with uh, Miranda's female. Why, why do you normally say women are hormonal, Miranda? Yeah, so why don't, I mean, men have hormones, right? Men have testosterone, androgen, all those things. Why do they? Why are men not referred to as hormonal? They aren't expressed as much. I don't know if it's not expressed as much. It's pretty consistent. And so the last part of the notes here, Miranda, you were spot on with the other part. Um, androgens, the male hormones like testosterone and androgen. Um, 
they help to, during puberty, um, help to initiate the production of sperm and also secondary sexual characteristics like facial hair and muscle mass and deep voice and all that kind of stuff. Um, and this is all stimulated by a hormone that comes from the hypothalamus um, or that's initiated by the hypothalamus comes from the pituitary called GNRH. GNRH is gonadotropin releasing hormone. What are your gonads? What are, who, who knows what the gonads are? It's in the book. I can say this on the internet. Katie, you know? You've all got gonads, I think, as far as I'm aware of. In men, the gonads are? Testes. testes. And in women, the gonads are? Tay? Ovaries. Ovaries, good. I don't know what y'all are so shy about. You're almost adults. Um, so anyway, the hormones that cause, that trigger the gonads, that target the gonads are, is gonadotropin releasing hormone. And these hormones are not released in a cyclic pattern like female hormones, so it's pretty consistent. Um, now, Miranda made a lot of sense when a lot of people refer to people being hormonal. A lot of times they talk about women. And, and so, like she said, there is an inconsistency in, well, it's not about inconsistency. There's a difference in the amount of hormones throughout the month. And if you look here, if you turn over to the female section, part four, and turn to 1026. On 1026 part D, what happens to female hormones throughout the month that you can see? Katie, what are those, fem what are those female hormones doing in part D? They're like, they're like all over the place. They're going up and down like a roller coaster, right? So there's a lot of variation in hormones that are released throughout the month. Now, I'm not advocating for anybody to call anybody um, hormonal or anything else because, to be honest, we're all hormonal. It's just, like I said, it varies quite a bit in women, um, especially throughout different parts of the menstrual cycle. Um, and like Walker said, you know, it varies with people. Teenagers are oftentimes referred to as hormonal because hormones change, especially like in middle, late middle school, usually for most people, where um, people undergo puberty, you have a major change in hormones. And then you also see a major change in hormones in women when, when they're 40s, when they're going through menopause. menopause. So you see a lot of hormonal changes, and those hormones can affect the way you act and do things. I mean, um, y'all probably have Men who take uh, steroids like testosterone, what are some hormonal changes we see? Like, like the effects? Yeah. Or increased muscle growth? Muscle growth. What well, about the way they act? It's like aggressive. Okay, be more aggressive. Yeah, so, I mean, there's a lot of different things that can result from those hormones. Remember, hormones are just chemical signals for our cells, and so they can have a big impact on the way that we act and the way that our body functions. All right, so let's... Skip back to page 1021. Now, we're mostly going to focus on women here because women are the ones that have the babies. And um, there's a lot of information. Um, guys are pretty simple, to be honest. And so the female reproductive cycle and what happens in terms of development and whatnot, which is part five of the notes, um, is a little bit more complicated. So we're gonna spend some time here the next couple of days. Ligands can be hormones or hormones can be ligands. I think it's probably a better way to say that. Signal transduction pathway has three different parts. So throughout the re female reproductive cycle, you have chemical signal signals that are triggering different parts or different phases of the reproductive cycle. And you know, as important as this is for AP Bio, I think this is probably really important for you guys as you grow, grow older. Um, probably in, you know, 10 or 15 years, all of you will have kids. Either you will have kids or you will, your spouse will have a kid. And it's important to know what's going on and understand reproductive cycles. You know, you hear about a lot of people who have trouble having kids. I'm sure y'all maybe have had a sister or aunt or somebody who's had trouble or a cousin that they can, it's almost impossible for them to have kids, seems like. 
And then some people, you know, they can start trying one month and then the next month they're pregnant. So um, it varies a lot in people on there. Um, I think our gyno, my wife's gyno said that um, most people it takes like six to nine months um, at least trying to get pregnant. So um, it is difficult. And so I think it's important to be aware of those difficulties and stuff that, you know, that comes up um, and understand why things are happening the way they are. So under female reproductive cycles, um, read A and B for us. Tay? Okay. <clears throat> I don't know that um, human females are really controlled that much by temperature, rainfall, and day length, but a lot of other animals can be influenced by that. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples here on cycles that favor energy conservation. Um, I read in, in a Nature magazine one time, and you guys will probably have to use the Google for this. I think it was a, a, some type of ferret. The ferrets, the female ferrets could mate with the male. They could have a like fertilized egg, and they could basically just like put it away in safekeeping for a while until environmental conditions were better. I want to say up to like nine months or maybe even a year. So they could have a fertilized egg. I, and I'm, you know, I don't think it was any kind of conscious thing, like I'm not ready yet. I think it was more like their body probably didn't have the nutrients and things that it needed in the environment. Like maybe in, it was very dry that time of year or something. And they were able to kind of hold onto that fertilized egg until environmental conditions improved. Excuse me. So uh, there's a few different organisms that can do that from what I'm aware of, but um, the ferrets were the one I was reading about. So that's pretty interesting that they're able to do that. That helps out with, so when the environment is good, they're already ready to go and they can, babies can implant and they can start developing. Um, deer, love to deer hunt. And so if you skip down to estrus cycles about halfway down the notes, um, many mammals do this. Um, most are not always like having a menstrual cycle kind of like we see in humans. A lot of times they're just going into heat like a couple times a year, once or twice a year maybe, um, like deer do. And so, um, I don't know if y'all are familiar with deer and like the rut, but basically like, so at a certain point in the year, and scientists think from what I've read, this is triggered by a photoperiodism, which means what? Photoperiodism. So a, a female deer goes into heat based on a, a light period. So meaning there's a certain amount of light in the day, their brain's like, oh, there's a certain amount of light in the day, and that triggers them to go into um, heat. And so when they do that, then they start releasing hormones and it attracts the male. And that's the most magical time of year for me because it's the best time of year to hunt deer because the males are out running around throwing caution to the wind. They don't care if they get shot or not, and all they care about is mating. So um, it, it's a beautiful thing. So anyway, um, why, if you're an animal like a deer or a squirrel or something like that, why would you only want to go into heat like in the late fall or winter time? Around here we see this a lot. Do what? When, if you get pregnant in the winter time, when are those babies gonna hatch out? Or, I mean, be born, what? Spring. It's late spring, early summer. So there's more food available. You, they can be born, they can grow, they can eat a lot during the summer, and then they're big enough by the next winter to kind of fend for themselves. So that's the idea. And so most deer, based on their genetics, whatever's like, they've evolved, whichever, whatever's best for them, they will go into heat at a certain time so that I think it's seven months later, they'll have the babies and then the babies have enough time to grow up and get big enough where they can survive the next winter. So that's beneficial for them, especially when you live in an environment like we do where you have a long kind of cold winter and um, there's not a lot of food available there. All right, let's see here, a couple more things. Let's go, th let's look at the actual parts of the female reproductive anatomy, and then we'll get into the hormonal stuff tomorrow and egg development. So on 1022, um, this picture at the bottom here, 
But this kind of reminds me of like a Texas Longhorn. Y'all can remember it however you want to, but basically like on the extensions on the outside, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna work backwards from the notes here. Um, I'm gonna actually start out at the ovaries. Ovaries, what's their main function? They're releasing the egg. So y'all saw this in the video. They release the eggs. The eggs move down the oviducts or fallopian tubes. It's the same thing. What happens in the fallopian tubes? Fertilization takes place. What do you not want to happen in the fallopian tubes? What? What would we call that? What's it called when it attaches somewhere? Implantation. So you do not want the egg to implant in the in the oviduct. There's not enough room for a baby to grow there. Um, sometimes that does happen. What's it called? What type of pregnancy? Ectopic. Ectopic pregnancy. Usually it grows and then it causes it to basically burst uh, or pop open. And there's bleeding and usually lose the baby. And occasionally you have this where the developing like embryo can like float around in your stomach like actually well not in your stomach organ but in your abdominal cavity and it could attach to like your stomach or your kidneys or your liver or somewhere like that which is really bad because it starts forming new blood vessels and then if you have to go in and take that baby out if it does develop which is would be super rare but it does happen sometimes then if you cut that cord like there's nothing like the placenta shrinks up so that you stop bleeding. You don't want like blood to just keep flowing between the baby and the mother when you know you cut the umbilical cord. But if there's blood vessels formed inside the abdomen, then you can like bleed out that way. It can be very dangerous. There was a woman, y'all can look her up, we're about out of time. In Morocco, she um she had an ectopic pregnancy. The baby developed in her abdomen somehow, and then she went to the hospital. She had some bleeding and some problems in stomach, and she knew she was going into labor, but obviously the baby couldn't come out because it wasn't in her uterus. And she got went to the hospital, saw somebody else having a C-section. She got scared. She ran home and never had the baby. And like 40 years later, they did like a 2020 on this, her abdomen was hurting, they went in, they cut it out, and like it had been surrounded by calcium. They cut it open and you could see like it was like a baby that had been in there. Obviously it wasn't live, but it, it, like you could tell what had happened. So, and anyway, so normally what happens though, the fertilized egg keeps bebopping down, gets to the uterus, and implants there, and that's where it starts developing. So, there are a number of hormones and things that control that, and we will talk about them tomorrow.